Welcome to another edition of Anglican on Scripted Episode 797. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Calvin Robinson, and this is Monday, the 27th of March, the year of our Lord, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, and as you can see, I have Cal- Calvin Robinson back as a guest, and he's agreed to sit down and talk with Kevin again on screen. Kind of weird, but uh, this is one of the great things we get to do with technology like uh, I use what's it called, Wirecast, is we can record interviews around the world. And uh, uh, many people who watch us from the UK, hey, that's Calvin. I watch him on GB. Oh boy, this is going to be exciting. And, <laughs> and the people in America going, Who's the guy Kevin's talking to? Is that not George? Oh, please. You've got viewers all over the world. <laughs> and so let's just talk a little bit quickly. Um, how you been doing since our last episode? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Uh, my, my parish ministry is, is growing and forming, and my public ministry is changing too. I've got a new TV program now. I've moved from Sundays at 3 p.m. Uh, to Saturdays at 7 p.m. So we've gone from quiet time to prime time, which is a massive opportunity to proclaim the gospel to a large audience. So things are looking good. Okay. You're on prime time, but I, it, from what I can tell, you don't get to wear your collar on, on your new slot. What's going on there? Yes, there are always compromises to be made and uh, always battles to be fought. This is a battle that I lost. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to say anything disparaging because I don't want to lose the platform, but you know, the platform <laughs> that I've been gifted by God for his ministry, mm-hmm. um, I have to, you know, well, pick the battles. And in this case, many people in the hierarchy did not want me to be wearing my collar. Now, I wear my collar because it's a witness to sure. Christ, but also it's our uniform, right, as deacons and priests mm-hmm. and bishops. It, it's, it's to let people know that we're there for them in pastoral ministry. And uh, but I, I, I can do my job without it. So, in order, it's the compromise I made to to be on a prime time slot essentially and so I, I get to speak truth to a wider audience but i don't get to do it in my collar yeah well it, it, the collar isn't magic you know no. you, you don't need it to do what you're doing uh and no, people now know for political reasons you're not able to wear it and so hey um calvin's still calvin tell me a little about about what you talk about in the show uh well i try to at least address current events from a faith perspective and just fight the good fight for the faith. So, for example, stories that other news agencies or other TV channels would not like to cover for political reasons. For example, we've had in the last few weeks a woman who was arrested for silently praying in her head, and she didn't get any coverage anywhere. We we were able to do that and mm-hmm. to fight for that, but we were able to do that. There's also a priest that got arrested for silently praying um, because we've got these horrible buffer zones popping up left, right, and center. Uh, we've got people being cancelled in workplaces. We've had a lecturer, a theology lecturer, who's been cancelled for speaking biblical truth on social media. And just basically anyone who's either being cancelled for speaking the truth or or being persecuted for being a Christian, I'm trying to use my platform to, well, to get, hand it to them, essentially, um, so that there's a bit of justice. Yeah, there's a bit of justice, but the cancelling culture is not just cancelling people, it's cancelling our mythology as well, especially in technology. I used to post political stuff on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and in doing so, people would uh, say they liked it by clicking the like button. Yes, I agree with this. This is something that uh, is happening in our society. Thank you for posting this and informing me because in general, I don't go looking for that type of news, Kevin. Thank you for putting this on fo- Facebook. And they would do that by clicking the like button. Now, if I post something on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, nobody's liking it, not because they don't agree with it. The audience hasn't changed, but they're afraid that just liking it will get them canceled. And we're seeing that throughout the world now that you're guilty by association, not just for the books you read, the churches you attend, but for the posts that you like. And that that's that's kind of the last tenor in this. Kevin, I think, I think this goes all the way up. So people on the, on the grassroots are feeling this absolutely, in that normal folk are feeling the pressure not to stand out 
amongst their peers because they're afraid of the work mob. But it goes all the way up. I had a call this morning, and I won't name the person because I do like them, but I had a call from a government minister in the UK that essentially said to me, be careful, you, you're appearing too controversial. I understand what you've tried to do and you're trying to put the biblical message across, but certain people within the Conservative Party have seen it as controversial. And I'm like, so be it. Yeah. If I'm speaking God's, God's truth and that p- people see that as a controversial statement, that's on them, not me, and that's not on him either. So <laughs> I, I think people are trying too hard to be seen as reasonable, and I think that's because they are afraid of this woke mob. Yeah, the, kind of the via media. Uh, certainly, we see that within the church, but we're seeing that within government. We just we're just trying to get along here. Can't we just get along? And in some ways, you can befriend, but you can't give up all your values. And I'm seeing this more and more uh, in in the political realms, especially here in America, as we we fight abortion and woke and trans in our schools. Um, they 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 seek the middle ground. And when you're dealing with the enemy, there is no middle ground. Exactly. When it comes to truth, there is no middle ground. There's, there's not always a nuance in truth. Truth sometimes is binary. You know, I had a debate with a, another conservative recently around these drag queen story hours. I think they're abhorrent. I think the idea of sexualizing children is one of the greatest evils a person can commit. And I'm happy to protest that and, and say, look, we should not be allowing men dressed as women, scantily dressed, gyrating and thrusting and doing sexual acts in front of young children. That should, everyone should agree that that's not mm-hmm. a good thing to be doing. However, one of these reasonable conservatives said, well, actually, no, you're, 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 you're imposing on people's freedoms, and actually it's up to the parents to decide what's appropriate for their children. And I'm like, no, no, some things are just inappropriate, full stop. It doesn't matter <laughs> whether some people think that that's okay or not. That, in a liberal progressive society, I get that adults can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. But children need protecting, and their innocence needs protecting. We should all, especially conservatives, agree with that. Absolutely, but these new reasonable conservatives do not want to be seen as, as uh, well, conservative, really. Yeah, well, and that's what we, that's the biggest message which we have lost is the protection of our children. Um, here in America, uh, the schools have been taken over by the woke culture, the trans culture, the sexual culture, um, the the people who were the. the um, sexually free in the 60s and 70s became teachers and had kids who are now teachers and that pervasive liberalism exists to the point that they think it's more important for them to have control over your child and your child's future than the parent as well and well, you know uh, why kevin it's because yeah, we do. this is an lgbt movement right mm-hmm. and they literally cannot recreate so they they cannot reproduce so they recruit. And, you know, just saying that, people say, that's a homophobic statement. I'm like, no, it's a statement of fact. Like, if you are pushing an agenda, pushing a movement that is against um, heteronormativity, and they're quite open that they want to smash heteronormativity, the only way to pass on that agenda is to recruit. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're doing with our young people. Um, I saw the a story that said uh, in 2007, the iPhone was created, 2006, 2007. Uh, in 2007, there was one transgender clinic here in America. Since the prevalence of uh, social media, the introduction and promotion of transgenderism on YouTube and TikTok and all these other places, we have completely confused a generation about who they are and their biological sex and who they uh, are intended to be. We're, and we're not allowed to tell them, you know, you're created and you're created with a purpose and that God loves you. Society is there to tell you that you are your God and you can choose who you want to be. And if it involves surgery and removing your genitals, we're here to help and pay for it. Yeah. What what has it changed makes, so much in the 20 years? It makes me incredibly sad, it really does. I, I saw one of these clips this morning of a, a young woman who has um, been mutilated. You know, she's had her chest removed. And she was, she was so distraught because people are still misgendering her. People still see her as a young woman mm-hmm. because she is a young woman. But she wants to be seen as a young man now. And she can't understand why the world can't see her in a way that she isn't. And I think we're just letting these people down. We really are. This, we're not being compassionate. We're not being kind. We're not being nice and all the things that people say we are by affirming these delusions. Because people will never be able to change their sex. And instead of 
convincing people that they're going to find themselves and find their true selves. We should be we should be telling people that look, you are your body and you are your soul. This is what makes you a human being, and it's not about a journey of self actualization. It's not about becoming yourself. Actually, the good thing to focus on is Christ in His kenosis emptying of yourself to be filled with god's will to be filled with to to follow the plan that god has set out for you that is where you find contentment that is where you find fulfillment and holiness and this idea of you're quite right in that they're making gods of themselves in this whole self self identity crisis when a person of a certain age starts using the word authentic and i am a authentic person they've entered this gnosticism of the age mm -hmm. and they have become little demigods and in doing so, they have the power to cancel you, to reject you, uh, and to call you phobic. And we, for my generation, doesn't want to be called phobic. Your generation doesn't want to be called phobic. And we, we run away from that word. Well, guess what? It's not phobic if it's real. <laughs> and we need to, 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 to push back against the word phobia here. Absolutely. We've got to take the power away from the word. Because the more they use it, the more it means nothing anyway. The word racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, all of these words, they, they've had so much power. And you're right, people have run away from them. But the moment we stop and say, no, that's not true. That's not, I'm not racist. I'm not transphobic. I'm not homophobic. I'm not any of the things you say. I'm just saying, no, what can they do? There's nothing they can do. Well, we could name call because they hate you're Christophobic. But you're right. I well, mean, I've, I've started using that. I've started well, to say you you're, you're Christophobic. Yeah, uh -huh. because we've got sometimes we've got to use their own weapons against them, and they don't like it up them, do they? Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned buffer zones, and it's something new in uh, UK law where they allow for a zone to be uh, put around abortion clinics. So far, yeah, they haven't extended this. I'm waiting for Justin Welby to extend that to churches, but a buffer zone where you can't silently pray, and you and I kind of talked about this a little bit in the last program. What is happening with it, and what's the reaction in the UK uh, to something like this? It's shocking, Kevin, because it's been pushed through Parliament. So they have these trial zones in Birmingham and a couple of other places where within a certain radius, quite a wide radius around these abortion centres, you could not do certain things. And they said it's to protect women. They said it's to protect vulnerable women from harassment, which doesn't go on, uh, from intimidation which doesn't take place um, but they've the rules are so broad that they said you cannot protest you cannot hand out literature and you cannot pray and not just pray out loud you cannot pray silently in your own head so what they're saying is that the the right so-called right to end a human life is more than freedom of worship freedom of association freedom of thoughts and this has been so this trial took place in a small area and now it's been pushed through Parliament. So these buffer zones can happen anywhere across the country now. And even if you are pro-abortion, even if you do think it's a human right for a woman to be able to kill her unborn child, even if that was the case, surely you should appreciate the right, or well, I hate this language of rights, but the idea that other people can present alternative options. We know from so many women that have received literature outside these evil centres that have offered other options and they haven't ended up killing their child and they've raised a, a beautiful young boy or girl and have been so thankful for that. So to take that option away is saying that women can no longer have informed consent. They can't make an informed choice. It's almost as if they prefer the abortion to take place. But it, we're not even talking about literature anymore. We're just talking about someone within a general visit, vicinity of the area praying in their heads. Like, that tells me that they understand the power of prayer. That tells me what they're really afraid of is truth and prayer. Yeah, well, it, it tells me that this is being conducted at a truly evil level because evil knows that prayer works. You know, your average person in the street, they don't know. Yeah, walking, just walking down the street, do you think prayer works? No, prayer doesn't work. I, I have no example of prayer working in my society. Well, we have the greatest example that prayer works when evil needs to ban it, stop it, and cancel it. Now, you were recently canceled by a Roman Catholic choir is I this is a strange story so I, I think we need to talk about it because you, you're one of the most canceled people I've ever inter interviewed so what's going on <laughs> I know I know they, they come to me left right and center but it, it's I mean it's not me is it it's prophesied that this would happen when you speak up for Christ's truth 
they will persecute you, right? But it's okay because we'll be blessed because of our persecution. So it's fine. Um, they can take everything from me in this worldly earth if they want to, but it doesn't matter because my reward will be in heaven. However, that doesn't make it any easier in the moment. And the ordinary act, I see them as allies. I really, really do. I think that what they're doing is fantastic, especially at the moment, because the Church of England has become apostates and we've heard, you know, the same-sex blessings and all the stuff they're doing. That's just the latest, you know, they've already... There's so much that CV has been doing for years that people need other options. There is GAFCON, which is very, very small in the United Kingdom. I'm a, fortunately a part of that uh, umbrella. But the only other options we have over here are GAFCON, the Orthodox, which is, again, very, very small, and the Roman Catholics, which is much larger. So it's much easier if people live in an area where there isn't a GAFCON church, there isn't an Orthodox church, they might have a Roman Catholic church. So that is an option for people that still want to go to church, but don't want to go to a post um, church where they're, where they're doing all kinds of dodgy, heretic, her heretical teachings. Um, so I think the ordinary has been good because it's been a way for people to maintain their Anglican patrimony whilst entering full communion with Rome. That's a great thing if that's what people want to do. However, you know, they invited me along to speak to their young young people's group, and it was great. Reception was amazing. Lots of sound, young people, very orthodox. And, you know, the priest and the Monsignor are nodding ahead while I'm giving my lecture on, we must stand firm in the faith. I'm like, this is great. And then I booked to use the Ordinary at Church to film our Easter special. So on GB News, I'm very fortunate in that they let me do an Easter special and a Christmas special every year. And it's not, you know, it's not overtly political or anything like that. It's not about the news. It's just about Jesus Christ. It's just about his gospel. And it's, it's pretty much why I do the job the rest of the time. So I get the opportunity to do those specials, right? I think it's a very good thing that we're able to proclaim the, the good news to a, a national audience on national television. And so the Ordinary Act gave us permission to use their church weeks ago in advance because all these things take a lot of yes, do. work to get going. And one week before we go into film, they cancel on us. So I'm like, well, these are allies, you know, theologically, um, politically, culturally. These are, these are supposedly good people. What's going on? And I said, look, it's you, Calvin. I'm like, what? Um, someone, in, someone or someone's, I don't know if it was one person or multiple people in the choir, bear in mind the choir is secular, they don't, they're a paid choir, they don't necessarily have to be members of the church, mm -hmm. has complained about me, suggesting that I'm hateful, homophobic. And when I pushed back on that, I said to the Monsignor, look, this is a teaching opportunity. If someone says that I'm homophobic because of something I've said, this is your chance to say, no, he's not. These, these are the Christian views on sexual ethics. This is the Christian view on holy matrimony. Like, it's a teaching opportunity, surely. He said, oh, it's not just that, you know, your Enoch Powell article didn't help and I'm like, well, that's an article I wrote back in November, a long time before we booked the church. Like, and you knew about the article. And the article, you know, people on the woke side of the movement will say it's, it's, it's that Enoch Powell was a racist. But I'm a mixed race person writing about my personal lived experience on the things that he was right about, not on race, but on immigration. And I have a right to express those opinions. And if people don't like it, so what? Tough. But apparently that's enough for them to say, look, you can't, you can no longer film an Easter special, you can no longer proclaim the good news to a national audience this Easter because someone or someone's in the choir doesn't like you. I find that incredibly sad. It is sad. Well, you mentioned that you're, you're multiracial. And uh, growing up, uh, I, my heritage is Norwegian and Prussian. I like talking about that. Uh, when I'm with my friends, they like talking about their heritage. Uh, what is your heritage? Good question. Uh, my my mum's side of the family are English, and as far back as I can find, they've always been English. And my dad's side of the family come from Jamaica, mm -hmm. and I uh, managed to trace back. So obviously Jamaica was mainly a, a slave land, was, so I wanted yeah. to find out where they originally were from. And it's Nigeria, so northwest Africa. So I've got part um, African heritage and part English heritage. No, I, I, I love that you asked the question, though, Kevin, because most people say, like, where are you from? Or, like, they want to tread on eggshells around, like, they just want to know what your heritage is. People, you can ask people what your heritage is. It's fine. <laughs> well, no, I, there's a person in the royal family who asked a, a, uh, another person who, uh, African descent, it looked, from what I saw, mm. heritage. And she got in trouble, and she got canceled, and I, I don't know if she got kicked out of the royal family, but she had to do an apology to her. What, yeah, she had to what is that about? Apologize. It was like she was being shamed 
uh, and it, it was a setup. It really was that Ngola Falozi, first of all, wasn't her real name. She's from South London. She's not African, and she dresses in African garb. But it is what the woke people would say is cultural appropriation because it's not her garb. But it's mix and matches of different tribes from different areas. It, anyone that's actually from Africa would say it doesn't make sense what she's doing and what she's wearing. Uh, it, her name didn't even make sense. The combination of the two names. So there was a lot of iffiness about it but it's very clear she wanted to make a statement and she was very bold and bright and colorful and so of course anyone would say well you know where are you from and if she says south london they'd be like, yeah but where are you really from you know she wants to get to the question of why do you look how you look <laughs> what statement are you trying to make uh, but there's no appropriate way to ask that question anymore without being cast as racist fortunately lady uh, suzanne hussey has been reinvited back into the royal family because the British public made it know we were not happy with her being cancelled because it was a setup by this political activist. All right. The biggest thing happening very soon is going to be uh, the coronation of King Charles. Um, that's, that's an event, uh, certainly of a generation, uh, if not a lifetime, because apparently the royals over there live a long time. And, <laughs> and and as such, what are your expectations for this? Do you think uh, uh, King Charles will, you know, do good for the Church of England or, or do good for uh, the UK? What are your expectations? Oof, I don't know. I'm actually on the fence on this one. It's not like me, but Her Majesty the Queen's funeral, I think, was the greatest public witness we've seen since the resurrection. I don't think That's, there's ever wow. been a service that's been broadcast to as many people, seen by as many people in the world, of just good old-fashioned, uh, well, Anglican liturgy, to be honest. Um, and I think she knew that, she planned that, and because she centred her life around Christ. She was a servant leader. Now, King Charles, I don't think he has her degree of faith. It doesn't mean he doesn't have faith. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very cautious and weary about the fact that he's said in the past he wants to defend the faiths and be a defender of faith rather than the faith. And he seems to be, you know, he's courted Islam a lot over the years. That really concerns me because it was obviously it's the widest spreading Christian heresy pr pr pretty much of all time. Um, but it's also a great risk to Western society. I think we can be welcoming and inclusive, and he as the king can be welcoming and inclusive and diverse and all those things that people want to be these days while still maintaining the truth and still being look i you could be look, i am a christian king um of christendom and that is a good thing however i also welcome other people of other faiths into our country that that's the way to do it for me but if he waters it down and has like muslim elements of the ceremony and i think he's having an lgbt choir and stuff it, it would just seem a bit odd to me that he's more afraid of the world than of god that's <laughs> that's the biggest issue we have uh actually from day one but you know that being said now you're traveling here to america uh to attend the anglican way institute um uh conference that's held yes. in texas i, I went to it so. uh, a couple times uh do you get to travel a lot with uh your uh career and uh parish ministry oh good question no i don't, haven't traveled a lot um, probably since COVID, really. Uh, in my previous career, I used to travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. I love meeting new people in different places. I'm very, very fortunate in that um, I've been invited out to the Anglican Way Institute. I'm really looking forward to that because they are good Anglicans, good Anglo-Catholics out there. Mm -hmm. and it'll be good to uh, to kind of get some advice on planting church and that kind of thing from them. Uh, but I'm also going out to the States to meet Matt Fred as well for Pints with Aquinas. He's flying me out there. So I'll, I'll have two trips to the U.S. and it's going to be the first time in a long time because the U.S. has had uh, tricky um, restrictions, let's say, since COVID, which I think they're finally going to get rid of at the end of April. Yeah, it, in fact, we're planning our travels for the summer and we see that there's still some places that require a mask. Uh, really? Where? I, some uh, federal uh, lands and national parks. It's ridiculous. And like, I, <sighs> to what end? I know, to what end, you know, I don't know. It, it, you know what, I was in crazy. Rome, I yeah. was in Rome last week. Okay. Um, wait a so minute, wait, what, what, hold, hold, what? Yeah. You're not going to swim. No, 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 I'm angry, I'm, I bleed angry. Um, <laughs> okay. But uh, I went out there to pick up my cassock in all honesty, because ah. uh, 
Gamarelli's make the best cassocks. And I, this is one I ordered months ago, but they work on Italian time, so you had to work around them. But it's cheaper to cheaper for me from London to fly out there, pick it up, and come straight back than it is to import it and get the customs and duties tax. Yes, and that. absolutely. Yeah. But I went out there, and the only people I saw wearing masks were the nuns. I'm like, what does that tell you about their faith? Or that you know, it's like surely they they should be the opposite. They should be like, no, we you know, we are our faith is in Christ and His healing power. And especially, you know, in church and when you're going to receive the Eucharist, it's like you're going to receive the body and blood of your Lord and Savior. You don't need to be protected from that. But it's just, I feel it's at odds with our faith. I really do. I don't get it. Uh, let's just finish off uh, by talking about uh, the Church of England. Uh, recently, the, the, the Synod of Bishops uh, put forward and passed on the recommendation for the LLF, the Living Love and Faith. And it's going to be taken up by the whole synod. And my expectation is that this will become the new rule for the Church of England. And that rule states that uh, churches and priests may bless same-sex unions and same-sex weddings. They cannot officiate. They cannot host. Um, but if a couple wants to come and be blessed, the priest is welcome to do so with new prayers. Uh, is this it? Is that the last of the, the Church of England? I think so, in all honesty. Yeah. And I've got a lot of good friends who are really good Christians who want to stay and fight from within and, and well played to them if they can do that. But this is it's gone too far. The red line has been crossed because at this point they're essentially saying that it is okay to bless same-sex marriage. And I know they're going to use different words and stuff, but what will happen in practice is that people will go and get a civil marriage um, to two same-sex people will go and get married in a registry office and then they'll go to church and it will be blessed which is essentially solemnizing the marriage right mm -hmm. and it's undermining what we know to be marriage and you know people again people call us homophobes and bigots and stuff but marriage means a, a lifelong union between one man and one woman like if in the rest of the world outside of Christianity you want to do something else call it something else that's fine but to, to use the word marriage undermines what marriage means for us but for the church to allow this, what they're actually doing is saying that it comes down to each individual priest to decide if they're going to do it, which is passing the buck because the priest should be able to say, no, this is what the church teaches. And that is their shield of Ephesians 6. That is their protection to say, you know, I have 2,000 years of tradition behind me. I have my bishops behind me. This institution that I serve says this is what we teach. Therefore, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do what you're asking. But they can no longer say that. So what's going to happen is that Orthodox priests are going to be hounded out and identified as bigots and not just from outside of the church not just from same-sex couples that want to get married but from within the church they won't be put up for promotion they'll be mocked on on certain it's already happening that they're getting mm -hmm. mocked in certain dioceses as unsafe parishes for, for the lgbt community this idea that disagreeing with some someone for, for very sound orthodox theological reasons makes a, a church unsafe like the language they're using is wicked and it's not very faithful. And what's going to happen is that actually the Orthodox are going to be ostracized. It's going to be far worse than what we saw with uh, the ordination of women. And I don't know, I honestly don't know how people are going to be able to serve under heretical bishops in an Anglican system. You know, we, we believe in the Episcopal, we, we're not congregationalists. We can't hunker down in our individual parishes because we serve vicariously for the bishop. So I don't know how people are going to maintain their theology and maintain their faith while serving under this new system unless and, there's an alternative oversight but you introduced the lie the lie is i'm going to stay and fight in the episcopal church there are hundreds of faithful clergy some bishops who stayed and said they would stay and fight that um that they would fight what the change is happening on the national level within the church i must stay and fight yeah. That's my call to do. What they do is they stay and they don't fight. They just say, I'm going to keep my parish. I'm going to keep my diocese safe. And they, they kind of lose the voice or the strength or the steadfastness to fight the good fight, you know, outside of what they're protected in. And Time is a weapon, isn't it? Yeah. And so, you know, what stay and fight for the Episcopal Church was in 2008, 2009, uh, those yeah. who stayed aren't fighting. A couple are. But... I don't see 
that trajectory in the Church of England as well. In fact, uh, young ordinance uh, in the uh, the Church of England are protesting this. Yes, the evangelical ordinance are doing a fine job of protesting. And I think it's it's good what they're doing. I met up with um, one fr from a, a high profile evangelical church the other day who's joining us in the Free Church of England and going to get ordained by us instead because the it, it, and I think that's brave and bold because. It, you know, you could still go through the CV route. You could still get ordained within the CV, and then have a decision to make about which bishop uh, ordains you and, and who you're going to serve under. But to to start from day one, or to exit your ordination process and to and to leave, that's that's quite bold. But I, I, the question I'd ask Kevin is: Has this ever worked? This fighting from within. So we've had many issues in the informed in the um, Episcopal Church, but also in the Church of England, you know, such as female ordination and and divorce, uh, lots of lots of heretical issues like that. Has the battle ever been reversed? Has it ever been won? Uh, there is one. Uh, I think it was a, a Lutheran church somewhere where they reversed it, but that's it. It was a uh, George would know. It's. Uh, Germany or is that Germany? That'd be the last Lutheran Church to reverse something, but uh, you know, it, it's a, a a European country where they they step back and say we we can't do that anymore. So, but other than that, no. Uh, that's why it's called progressive. That's why it's called yeah. liberal. It's it, more accepting. It doesn't cause uh, steadfastness. You don't have to push and hold your your way. You just have to be looking for the via media. You have to be looking for that middle ground. And when you realize evil doesn't negotiate, evil doesn't accept the middle ground, then you've lost. And you do need to uh, start elsewhere. And now starting elsewhere, um, GAFCON 4 is coming up uh, in Kigali. GAFCON 2 put out the call to retake the shores of the UK for the, the Christ because they saw that the Church of England just wasn't doing its job. Do you think uh, GAFCON could have a a long-term influence uh, in uh, the UK and especially Europe down the road. I hope so. I do. Um, I know of a, no a number of priests who are leaving the CV to come over to GAFCON, and I know a number of ordinances that are doing a similar thing. But we're just so small in the UK because the system is so different yeah. in that the established church has its tendrils in every uh, element of public life. and. Uh, I'm unsure how it's going to work because we can't, for example, have a system like you had in the States. We've got alternative Episcopal oversight, mm -hmm. as in someone, a Gafcon bishop looking after your church. Like we, people over here have to literally leave the CV and become a member of, of Gafcon. And I don't know if people are bold enough. I pray that they are. I pray that people get the courage and the strength they need to stand firm in the faith and to leave behind the worldly traps of, of prestige and, and beautiful buildings and stipends and, and houses and schools and to leave all that behind for Christ, I really do. I pray for that every day, but it's difficult. It is. You have been gracious with your time. We had a, a great, fun conversation. I look forward to our next one. Thank you so much. This has been Anglican Unscripted, episode 797.